today, today we are really going to um, focus, you have seen my disclosures, I'm just going to move on from that. We're really going to focus on training. And one of the really neat things about this format that we're doing is that typically I would not spend a full hour talking about training because it's, you know, there's so many other things that we typically would need to cover in a typical session that I do. Uh, so it was, it's quite a luxury to delve into the real nitty gritty stuff of training. And when you think about training, it's not just a little thing, it's a lot of things. It's a procedural training for your core team members, as well as your other team members, your school members, your administrators. Uh, you also will want to provide information and training to parents and physicians. Uh, there's training on the safe eating plan, which is, of course is so essential. And then uh, the cafeteria staff needs to be trained, at least initially, uh, and ongoing working with them to make sure they know what they're doing about texture modification and updating skills. So we're going to talk about all these different kinds of training um, that can take that need to take place in the schools. We're also going to talk about competency and getting the skills that we need to provide these services that are so important. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about leadership. So before you set up any of those trainings that I just referred to, there's a few things that really have to be established. First of all, you really must have administrative support uh, for a team procedure. Uh, you can't go in and start training people when your administration doesn't really know what's happening and are not familiar with what you're doing. So that's a very important piece. And we've talked about this. You, a lot of this stuff you hear me say over and over in different contexts. Uh, the second one is that they have approved an established procedure uh, for addressing swallowing and feeding and that it is used throughout your district. Okay. So in order to do this training, you have to have that procedure in place. It doesn't have to be my procedure. It can be whatever procedure your district has decided works for you. Um, and then that the procedure should always include a team approach. So you have a team of people that you are working with. Another uh, thing that is necessary prior to setting it up is that you have looked at uh, every school in the district and that each school has a designated core team of specialists, which would be our SLP, OT, PT, and school nurse. And it doesn't have to be that they live in that school, they can travel to that school, but whatever your setup is, you should have those professionals on call in case a student uh, with swallowing and feeding disorder is placed at that school. And then finally, there is an administrator or a designated pro professional who will be responsible for organizing the training of team members, including the core team and the school staff. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the, you do need somebody who's kind of managing all this. So when I really sat down and sorted through it and thought about it, um, there's these trainings need to take place in a certain order. And it starts with your school administrators, goes to your core team, your school team, your informational training for parents and physicians, safe eating plan training, your new staff and yearly procedural training, and then updating skills, of course, would be happening all the time. So we're gonna go through each of these briefly. Um, almost every training that we're talking about, uh, probably with the exception of the swallow plan training, will cover procedure, okay? Because it's very important that when you have a procedure that everyone knows what to do, when to do it, who's going to do it. So you're going to hear that repetitively <laughs> as I go through this. Your core team needs extensive training. Your classroom staff and, and administrators need some basic training on the procedure. Your parents will need a, an overview. They don't need details, but an idea of what is happening, as does the medical team so that they understand that the schools are now active in this. We are now participants in helping these children uh, overcome their swallowing and feeding disorders while they're in school. And then uh, of course the procedural training for throughout the school year. So we'll begin with our administration training. Uh, now that includes um, 
the supervisor of special ed and the supervisor of food services. You'll have to do some minimal training with a superintendent or the supervisor of special ed can do that just so they're aware of what uh, we're talking about and how we're gonna do it. Uh, and then you go down to the next letter level, which would be coordinators of speech pathology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, nurses. In some districts, there's one person that oversees related service, a coordinator of related service. It may be called a lead therapist. I don't know how your district is set up, but you know, and you'll know who the person I'm talking about. All of those people really need to know and understand what a uh, swallowing feeding disorder is and what the procedure is that is being used. So for our administrative tasks, we wanna go through, remember we talked about the who and what of dysphagia. Uh, we talked about pediatric feeding disorders. Uh, who are the children uh, most at risk? What are the risk factors? What are the causes of it? Uh, the, the administrators need to know that because they won't automatically know what you're talking about unless they've had that a personal experience with it. And I found many times they don't. So you really have to serve as an educator in training your administrative staff. Uh, also, very important, what can we do for these students? So we're going to tell them, well, here's the risk factors. Here's all the students that are really at risk. We need to go a step further and say, and here's what we can do. Here's how we can make them safer, more efficient, and able to enjoy meals at school, better, you know, more than they are. Um, and so we want to go through with the administrators briefly, because administrators are busy people, why a district approved procedure is important and the essentials of the procedure. And of course, we've talked about that in a previous ECHO course, you know, the uh, essentials uh, being, you know, a team approach, uh, and I'm going to go blank list, listing them all, but you have them in your handouts from previous sessions. So you want to talk to them about what are the essential parts of a, a swallowing and feeding step-by-step -step procedure, a team approach, um, roles and responsibilities, uh, those types of things. And then you want to be sure that they understand what their role is in the identification and the treating of pediatric feeding disorders. And it'll be different. The superintendent will have a different role than your supervisor of special ed or your supervisor of food service will also have a different role. So you want them to know what is expected of them. Okay, so now let's move on to our core team training. Uh, and the core team is made up of the SLP, the OT, the PT, and the school nurse. And you know, I always say, I think that every member of this core team is essential. Um, so put together your team, and then let's talk about how to train them. So <clears throat> who is responsible for the core team? You're starting this procedure in your school district. Um, you have these people that you feel can serve as your core team member. Well, who's going to be the person to train them? Um, <clears throat> it can be done by that swallowing and feeding coordinator that I talked about, or the consultant, the person who is really going to be overseeing it for the district. That person often can uh, at least coordinate the training of the core team, or they themselves can do it. Uh, in other cases, you can maybe pick a core team that has a lot of training, a lot of experience, in addressing swallowing and feeding, and they can help to train the other core team members uh, on the procedure and on the specific roles and responsibilities that everyone has to uh, be responsible for. Um, so I think that an annual training for all core members, team members is essential. Uh, what what uh, I recommend is a two hour training per year on the procedure itself and the completion of forms. And as you'll see, as I talk through this, um, the, the training for the core team is much more detailed, much more specific, uh, much more involved than the training for anyone else, okay? So that training, uh, it could be a pre-recorded training that people are able to view as they want to. 
um, but it needs to be fairly detailed. Then you can have an additional one to four hours training on swallowing and feeding assessment therapy to work on things to expand your knowledge and skills. Um, as I was thinking about this, I think, you know, we have different categories of people who are listening today. We have those who maybe had a, a graduate level course years ago and have never used their course. They have some work to do to update their skills. We have others that feel totally and completely comfort, comfortable and competent in addressing swallowing and feeding. And then we have everything in between. But regardless of where you fall on that spectrum there, um, updating skills is part of our code of ethics. It's part of what we have to do. And when we talk about treating uh, dysphagia or feeding disorders, we're talking about something that is forever changing. It's evolving, we're getting better at it. Things that we did 10 years ago, we would no, no longer be doing because the research has shown it's not effective or it's not what, that there's something else better. So it's important that regardless of where you are, that you place a priority on training and updating skills in dysphagia and feeding disorders. Um, like you probably do with all your other areas that you work on. And I know there's only so much time you can dedicate to this kind of thing, but in, in this disorder, it's so extremely important. So the annual training should of uh, the core team should include a review of each step of the procedure, including what is the step, uh, you know, why are we doing this step? Why is it important? And what form do we use? And how do I complete that form? That might sound kind of silly, like I'll just complete it. But when you get into the interdisciplinary observation form, that's fairly complicated. And when you talk about the parent interview, you wanna go through those and be familiar with what you're asking so that you can be prepared for follow-up uh, questions when you're talking to the parent, or you can uh, comment on what they're saying. So you have to be very familiar with the forms and the things you're asking of the parents with the form and what you're doing to identify it um, in order to really be uh, as effective as you would want to be. Uh, and then who is responsible for completing the form? Um, you know, typically I say you should uh, have someone serve as a team leader and that person uh, could be an SLP or an OT. In some cases, it's a nurse. Uh, sometimes it could even be a PT. Um, but the person makes sure that the uh, procedure is followed with fidelity and that the forms are all completed correctly and, and uh, that you have that record. So it can be someone designated as a team leader, which I think is a good way to do it uh, because then there's no question about who is going to be completing the form but you may want to split up the tasks. I don't know. It's really up to you how you do your team. Um, but it's also important to know and understand why each step is important and why it's important that every step is done. Because what we found in our work is that um, there cannot be any redundancy. I mean, there needs to be redundancy, sorry. We cannot have any gray areas. We have to know that things are covered very completely and thoroughly. And that's why this training is so important. So we wanna review the roles and responsibilities, not only of yourself, but of the other team members and uh, make sure that you really understand who's responsible for what and who you need to call on for something. Uh, so you need a detailed information on your own role, okay? Your own particular role, your professional responsibilities uh, for establishing safe eating. And then you want, a always because the parents are so important you want a review of working with parents you want to keep on the forefront how important it is that we team up with the parent that we listen to them that we find out what's happening with them what their concerns are and what their stresses are so that we can work with them to keep their child safe at school 
and then working with the students medical team if you've got a good relationship going with your parents you then can also communicate with your physicians and get their mo your their most updated information so a review of how to do that and what's most effective what other team members have found effective would be a good use of training time so it's awfully often beneficial to have some specific information or instruction on how to put perform the little the steps of the procedure. So for example, an SLP who has a lot of experience with clinical evaluations came from the hospital setting had done quite a few can show the other team members the interdisciplinary observation using a student. Um, so they might show how they would then take that information. It could be done through, you could film her uh, person doing an instrumental in the cafeteria um or just talk about it and then you can show how you they how you can take the information from the referral the parent uh interview and the instrument um interdisciplinary observation to come up with a safe eating plan another example would be a therapist and a nurse could demonstrate reviewing a parent interview form with the parent probing for additional medical information and providing the parent with information based on the evaluation of their child. So we found, we did this, we did a film of this, and it was really very helpful um, in just having the nurse, and, and in our case, it was the SLP, interviewing the parent and talking about the things that she was telling us. We got additional information that she hadn't really written on the form. Okay, so let's just take a breather and see, does anyone have a comment or a question that they wanna, say about the two types of trainings we've talked about, the administrative training and the core team training. As we think about all of the scenarios that people are working in with their feeding team and and you know partnering with districts and coming in as consultants, some of these things may get a little complicated. And this is what I'm hearing in the early world that uh, particularly if it's somebody who's at a community organization um, and somebody who's at Head Start, just making sure that everybody is part of that communication. I think that some of it is going to be served on a face-to-face uh, -face basis, but also some of it can be served um, in a house training like we're doing right now mm -hmm. and uh, bringing it virtually and sharing it, making it in a place that people can refer back to it. And so I also looking forward at this paraprofessional piece and teachers. Um, we at our town hall meeting this week, um, a statewide town hall for therapists, really are tackling the topic of paraeducator, paraprofessional training. And we're talking about lifting and all of those things. But as we look at this, think about, uh, and we're looking at developing something, some trainings similar to what we're doing now. So think about that in relation <laughs> to feeding and what those paras need to know and how can we incorporate that. So I'm going to be quiet. It's not about me, but <laughs> yeah, I, I just love being able to tie it together with these yeah, conversations. And, and when you talk about those early childhood uh, uh, programs, you may not be going into a public school. You may be going into a more private setting or a head start or something. And that, you know, then your training would need to really be you have to work with that school, that staff uh, administration as to what kind of training you actually can do uh, once we get into the cl this classroom staff training. So let's move on and no one has. Uh, there was another on. question. Hannah wanted to oh, know how okay. often do you recommend administrative staff training? Um, you know, I think that in in, in our case, we, we did it um, initially when we we're coming up. And then after that, I would say, maybe once a year once every other year it's not an area that you have to do like it's not as um doesn't need to be repeated as often as the core team and the classroom staff because your administrative staff often does not turn over and they really need just a good general idea of what is happening in the schools because they never want to be surprised believe me administration never wants to be surprised so you want to let them know what is happening? So I, I think if you have a big turnover administration, then you would say, okay, we need to do another training. And again, you still could do the recorded training for administrators that they then could access 
Um, you know, I think this is something that's coming out of our COVID era that we're going to be doing more virtual training. And it's very ac accessible for these administrators who are very busy. And you could do an hour recording that they could access and really uh, get the information they need so that they aren't surprised if a parent talks to them or something. That includes principals. Good question. Any others before we move on? Yeah, I have a question. This is Mary Ellen. Um, I'm curious if there's uh, any uh, trainings that are out there that are already made uh, <laughs> for higher level superintendents and um, directors of special ed services to um, help raise their awareness of the of the need uh, for a feeding team and for um, the, a higher um, a, awareness of the, um, the the safety and the risk that's involved. We're, we're pairing together something from a, a prior presentation that you made, Emily, and, and are sharing some of the minutes from um, some of the statistics that you shared from uh, like court cases and the statistics mm -hmm. of individuals with disability and, and the incidence of speeding uh, safety risks. But you know, other than that, we don't we don't really know what to, to share with them to try to um, grab their attention uh, because there seems to be this lack of uh, urgency, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think a lack of understanding to a certain extent too of of what we're talking about here and why it's so important. Um, I, the, it, the, the administration is one of the biggest obstacles. It, it truly is. Um, and I, I think there is a need for what you're talking about. Um, and I did put together a um, presentation for a state to their administrators. Um, I'll take a look at it and see if I can make some suggestions for you. There, I, there's nothing I know of out there for that. Um, but it is something that I think needs to be pursued. So I, I will definitely take a look at that. Let me write that down and share with you. And I, I understand you're, you're in the schools, you're working, you know, for you to put together a parent point, a PowerPoint presentation from that's very time intensive. So I, I really admire you for putting in the work and I'll try to make it as easy as I can for you. Um, and send you some information on that. Well, probably through Deborah. So I have a question. This is Vicki. Mm -hmm. um, I work in an ESD and so I see kids for feeding swallowing in lots of different di districts, lots of different schools. What administrator am I training? Is it the administrators in those individual schools? Is it my supervisor and and superintendent i mean there's a i mean i, yeah. I see kids across uh well at least three different districts oh so, so vicky what i would say to that is that all administrators need to know what you're doing because we're talking about something that is potentially health related and and you know could uh have an effect plus you're talking about changing how, maybe changing how a, uh, the child may be fed differently than they're fed at home. And so parents aren't sometimes going to be very happy with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, administrator, your administrator needs to look, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. This is what it means. And this is, you know, but then to those schools that you go to, and that's why I say really to putting together a pamphlet or a short PowerPoint or something that they can access it because you don't have time to sit there <laughs> and train three, four different administrative staffs. So we have to get make good use of our time. And you're such a good coordinated group. One person comes up with a good administrative PowerPoint, share it with everyone, and then no, no one else has to do it, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and that's kind of where I operate. I don't want you guys to have to recreate the wheel that we already spent 25 years doing. And that's why I so freely share my information and my handouts and, and all that. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not sure I have one of those that I would be ready to share blanket it I need to look at it again to see if I felt it would work you know um and if I do I I would be happy to share it but um I think you have to you have to train all of them 
Okay, so we're if gonna anybody go does have a resource like that, we're crowdsourcing here. So feel Absolutely. free to share it and we will put it all together. In public schools, we have to do that the, as often as we can because we do not have time to do other, we're so busy. Okay, let's talk about training the classroom staff. We're primarily talking about classroom teachers and paraprofessionals, okay? They will need a much less detailed description of the procedure. Uh, it too should happen annually. We want it to always be on their mind what the steps are why, and what their roles are. Um, I think it works best in most cases for the school's core team to train the teachers and paraprofessionals in their school setting. Um, but we also, you know, have done big where you pull in all the paraprofessionals and train them as a group or all the teachers. So it can be done either way. They need to be trained on the definition of swallowing and feeding, its risk factors, signs and symptoms, students most at risk. That's across the board. Everyone needs to know that. Everyone needs to know step-by-step -step procedure for identifying and treating, but remember, you're going to be much briefer, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the individual roles and responsibilities of all team members, and you want to give them that handout that I gave you once. I mean, don't feel free to, to edit it to what you're doing and the roles and responsibilities of your team members, but once you've done that, it's okay to give them a, a uh, folder and have the who and what of swallowing and feeding and the roles of responsibility and a summary of the team procedure so that they'll have it to refer back to. Uh, and I think that's very effective. So when you're training school team members, um, you need to educate them on, well, gosh, we just said that. Um, what are the risk factors? What are the signs? And who are the students? That's a little repetitive. You also want to talk to them about why we're doing this. Uh, I frequently say it's important to understand why you're being asked to do something. And I believe that of teachers and paraprofessionals as well. And briefly, the student safety piece, the access to their curriculum, because if they're absent, they're not accessing their curriculum, if they're sick, uh, the nutrition and hydration at school issue and federal regulations. Um, so they also need to understand that it is educational re relevant because students need to attend school in order to be able to learn, um, that attention and stamina are affected when a child is undernourished or is not eating uh, adequately. And then socially that they're able to eat in their cafeteria with their peers in as close of a time frame as possible. So let's just break down why teachers and classroom paraprofessionals are so important when it comes to school meal times. I know you know this, but when we're talking about training them, we want to be sure we train them well. And the reason it's so important is that they know the students better than anyone else in the school and especially when it comes to their eating. They're often with those students at breakfast, snack times, lunch, parties, field day, whatever. So they really become a very important part of this child's mealtime habits. Because of this, uh, they will help us um, to recognize when the child is starting to struggle when our safe eating plan maybe is no longer being effective. And we know that these children do change and they don't change on any particular schedule. They may change in October, they may cha change in March. We don't know when they're gonna change. So we need to train that classroom staff so they know, and that's why it's so important. And we rely on the classroom staff for feedback whether it's in language therapy, motor skills, or in feeding. So the classroom staff is so important. And so you want to teach, you want to work with them on training them on the team approach with the clarification of roles and responsibility, the procedure and how it has accompanying forms and the steps that would be followed. Talk about the redundancy and that's why each step is important. Uh, the establishment of the safe eating plan that they will be responsible for. And um, the training of all the staff, uh, an adequate number of staff, so that when one or two or three people even are absent, there is a backup plan. So you also wanna talk about the maintenance of safety and how important it is to that 
the team members will be monitoring the implement and that, that's just part of the procedure. It's not that you don't trust what they're doing or you don't feel they're doing it. It's part of really being on top of keeping children safe at school. And the procedure must be followed with fidelity from the very first step all the way to the end for any student who has those risk factors. Everyone who is trained needs to understand that. So this is what I would give them, something like this, to explain the procedure to them. Uh, this is the process of what, they're, what you're going to be going through. And um, they can see where they would fit in. They certainly would fit in probably with the referral. Um, they may help us to get a good parent interview if they have a good relationship with the parents. Um, they will be aware of the interdisciplinary and the class, the paraprofessional will probably be conducting it with you. Um, they will need to implement the swallow plan. Uh, and the uh, classroom teacher in particular needs to be aware of the health plan as well as the, well as the emergency plan for uh, in, in, case, in the event of choking um, and so on. So each of the steps is important for them to know. They just don't know, need to know how to fill out all the forms and, and you know, all the things that the OT needs to know about what she's doing and the PT, what they're doing. They don't need all that, but they need this. So they also need to know when, what are the signs when their safe eating plan that you've trained them on is no longer effective? Um, you know, like I said, they change all the time. A plan that was established at that beginning of the year, which is what we do, really later in the year may no longer be effective. Growth and illness during the year often triggers changes. Um, so what are the changes they need to be aware of? They need to be aware that if they start hearing audible or hard swallows or gulping, that that's an issue. Any appearance of pain, increase in negative disruptions or early satiety. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Wet, gurgly, vocal quality during feeding, uh, persistent coughing. Uh, it's, you know, that needs to be reported. Uh, poor elimination patterns, vomiting, spitting up, uh, respiratory changes, swallowing foods whole, excessive chewing. Any of these that didn't occur before and are occurring, or if they're occurring in spite of the plan, the uh, team would need to know. And so training your staff, your classroom staff, on how to recognize when the plan is no longer effective is so important. So here's an example of the classroom teacher as a referral source. So the classroom staff's been trained on the particulars of the plan and the steps of the procedure and their role. So recognizing the risk factors on a student in the classroom, the teacher um, fills out the referral form. The, uh, she gives it to the core team member who is probably designated as a team leader to start the process. The teacher knows because you've trained her on the procedure that the next step is that the SLP and OT will, will call home, will send a message home to the parents. That's important that they know that because the parent may come talk to them about it. So they say, oh yeah, that's part of our procedure. They're just trying to gather more information. So our teachers can really help to make it flow better. Um, once the interdisciplinary observation has been completed and the safe plan is uh, established, the food service provider is trained and everything's in place, then the teacher is responsible for setting up the IEP. So this teacher sets up the IEP, everyone is there. Um, this child has a plan that has already been started, waiting for the IEP. The teacher understood the disorder, she understood the procedure, Understand, understood her role as where as what everyone else was going to be doing. And the result was that the child has a safe eating plan. So that's kind of the flow of how it's going. But you can see how we need to look at each team member as being so important because without that teacher or that paraprofessional knowing what they're doing, our procedure will not work. It just won't. It's essential that they know what they're doing. Any comments or questions about training classroom staff? No, we're good. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to informational training for parents. And uh, I think one of the things that I find is important 
important. Remember I said administrators don't like to be surprised. Well, you know, parents, the more they know and understand, I think the smoother it can go, okay? Um, so um, I don't know what I did here, but obviously I didn't mean for that. Uh, so that they need to know uh, that the procedure is followed with all students. Uh, who exhibit the signs and symptoms of a swallowing disorder. And the reason I say that is that we had parents who really took it personally. They really felt that we had singled out their child and we were trying to make them eat differently um, and that, you know, others weren't getting the same treatment. And so it's important for them to know that this is a district procedure, that if the child has the symptoms that their child has, they're going to go through this procedure, that that's the way it works. Um, and somehow that helps for them to not think that their child is really being singled out. And we want them to know that we use a team approach so that we can really gather all the important information to get their child safe, but not just safe, efficient at mealtime so they get adequate nutrition and that they can enjoy their meal, that they don't get fatigued, that they're able to really make it through the meal and get the nutrition they need and participate with their classmates. And that we need the parent as a collaborative partner in the team. And let them know that the goal of this team procedure is safe and efficient mealtimes at school for students with pediatric feeding disorders. And so, you know, it sounds kind of simple to do that, but it's very important that parents know these two things, that there is a procedure and that the goal is really safe eating for children. Um, so the information can be provided by the team leader or any of the core team members. Sometimes it's helpful to figure out who the parent has the best relationship with, and it could be the classroom teacher. It could be the nurse. So, you know, look at your team and say, okay, this parent, I think this person should be the one really talking to them and explaining it. Um, so you're gonna educate them a little bit. You're gonna talk about what the swallowing disorders are and all those things that we've talked and what we can do. Again, that issue of what can we do to help your child eat safer and more efficiently at school. So remember, um, you want, might wanna provide parents with the, re once you've done that kind of training from the previous slide, then you want to uh, give them information on their child specifically. So what, uh, what did you find out at the interdisciplinary observation? And what did you, what is in the safe eating plan that's established for the child? Um, offer to train the parents on the plan if they're interested in using it at home. So it's a little different from what they're doing at home, but it results in the child getting more nutrition quicker and more efficiently at, at school. They may wanna to learn to do it at home as well. Um, you want to inform them of who to contact with questions and how to contact them. So in this case, if, if they have a question about positioning their child, then you would let give them the name of the physical therapist who had set up their positioning and so on, okay? So that they know who to contact. And then also informational training for physicians. Most of our children, of course, see a pediatrician, but many of our children see ENT doctors, gastroenterologists, pulmonologists, and neurologists. Some of our more involved children only see a neurologist, we found, and many of our children see the same neurologist or the same pediatrician. So these, it's very um, proactive that when you're getting started working, that you spend a little time informing that physician of the school system's uh, philosophy on swallowing and feeding, what their procedure is, and what their plans uh, for safe eating for children in general will be. Um, so um, it, I think it's helpful for them to understand that there is a procedure in place, that it is a team approach, that it is approved throughout the district, that it involves communication with the parents and working closely with the parents, and it results in a safe eating plan for children uh, 
that they may be seeing. So they may be interested in getting that swallowing feeding plan, eating plan to kind of see uh, what is happening with their patient. Of course, you know that you would have to get parent permission for that. Um, so I've, I've recommended to school districts to put together an informational pamphlet for physicians so that they can um, uh, understand why the school is maybe calling them about a child swallowing problem. Our physicians were very skeptical at first when we were calling them. They didn't understand why the schools would be calling for a medical issue. Um, so there's a little bridging that needs to happen there. Um, I, uh, Feeding Matters, uh, uh, a website I think you're all pretty familiar with, they have a guidebook for parents uh, that is supposed to be, uh, the goal of that guidebook was be, to be put in physicians' offices. And it, it, uh, I did a section on swallowing and feeding in the school setting. So that would be a great resource to, to get a copy of it and distribute it to your physicians. It has maybe more than, than we need our physicians to know because it goes into infants and babies and all of that has, you know, the school's a very small portion of their guidebook. But it is in there and it is something that you could go by at least to put together your information source. Okay, so that really concludes the um, procedural type training that we do. Uh, any comments or questions before I move on to the safe eating plan training? Are you guys doing any of this kind of training? Were you aware that this was something that probably should be done? How have you addressed having people know what you're doing when you're setting up a safe plan? I, I'd kind of be interested to know what people are currently doing. Is it similar to what I've talked about? Anyone? This is Eddie and I can talk to that. Okay. Um, I am, now I'm one of those at this point in time, we're putting together um, a team to try to get feeding teams implemented, but I'm one of those people who um, is the sole feeding specialist. Um, I put in a safe feeding protocol, it's written up. Um, I train the teacher and the school staff um, and then they have a copy of it for them. They have a copy that goes along with the IEP. Um, parents during the IEP are notified. So it's put in the IEP that there is a safe feeding protocol in place. Um, and of course I talk with the parents, but we don't, I don't really go to the medical team unless it's a matter of trying to get a hold of them for medical information on, for instance, a possible swallowing study, um, et cetera. So that's kind of how we're doing it here. I'm working together with the um, OTs in my ESD and we're trying to get a team approach implemented. So are you training your classroom staff though, once you get, well, you do train them on the plan, but once you get a procedure, you'll let them know what their role is and that kind of thing. I I think that's often helpful, but. Absolutely. And yeah. the staff that, I mean, we're in a situation right now with a risky feeder. Um, the staff and I have a very close communication. They let me know um, either by email or by text, because if it's a risky feeder, then I give them my cell phone um, number. Um, so we are a team together. Even yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of good things going on. Maybe just need to package it, you know. Exactly. Um, I, I think um, the, the thing with a physician is proactive, okay? That's just getting them some information ahead of time so that when you do have a problem and you come to them, they don't spend a lot of energy saying, well, this is, you know, this isn't educational. We're supposed to be doing this. You don't need to be asking about this, you know? Um, and that took time, to be honest, for us to get our physicians. Now they all know, okay, yeah, the school district does that. But when we started, they did not know that. And they were a little resistive. And that's why I mentioned maybe an informational pamphlet of some sort for physicians. It, it could help. Okay, let, thank you so much for your uh, uh, input. That, that's very helpful to know. And are you uh, at Willamette ESD? Is that where you are, Eddie? Uh, yes, that is where I am. I'm just looking at what's happening in pockets around our state. So thank you for that. 
Go ahead, Emily. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to move into the safe eating plan, training the classroom staff on how to feed the child. Okay, um, so of course you're training the staff on the each student's individual plan and how to implement it with fidelity. Uh, the team leader monitors the implementation of the safe eating plan to determine if additional information or retraining is necessary. And the cafeteria staff is informed of the recommendations and the team leader will work with the cafeteria to set up a plan for providing meals that follow the safe eating plan recommendations and maintain nutritional value for that student. So the safe eating plan is typically done by the core team members uh, for the, the classroom staff. Now, what, what you need to do is um, decide, well, we'll get to that. First, the OT is going to train on the uh, and and under I understand that your your structure may be a little different than how uh, our structure is. So you would need to make your adaptations as to who's responsible for what based on what you're doing. But um, just for these purposes, the OT typically trains on adaptive utensils, bowls, bats, things of that sort. They also provide information on sensory issues uh, that the students has and how to approach them during meals. Uh, the physical therapist on how to position the student in their wheelchair, the cafeteria bench or other chair, show the staff how to stabilize the student's position and to provide the support that is necessary for optimal feeding. The SLP typically trains on the swallowing and feeding plans such as food modification, liquid modification, drink to bite ratio, size of bite, pace of presiding, presenting a bite and other directives on the plan. And the nurse is responsible for the emergency plan training. That's when there's uh, what to do in a choking event and for CPR and Heimlich training. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that you need to do is determine what is the level of monitoring that each student needs, okay? Um, so you're gonna wanna identify primary and backup feeders that are fully trained for each student. Um, and you're also going to want to determine the level of monitoring that each child is going to need. Some will need one on one because of their severity of their situation. Some will be fine with two on one or, or one parent maybe watching three of them if they're very mild cases. The things that really affect how much monitoring we're doing is the severity of the child and their uh, swallowing and eating plan, but also um, how. Uh, how well does the classroom staff implement the plan? So if you have a classroom staff that you're not particularly comfortable, then you, you might want to have them be one-on-one -on -one with that child and you yourself might wanna monitor them more often. This form can be helpful. I think I've shared it before um, for the teacher to organize who are the trained people so that at a glance, if one is absent, we know who the next one to go to. So some thoughts on training to feed someone. Uh, a person with significant feeding impairment, and many of our children are like this, are really dependent on their caregivers for meals and nutrition. At home, it's the parents, and at school, it's the school, it's the school staff, the classroom staff. Um, talk to the child. Let them know, and, and this is what you want to train your classroom staff to do. Talk to the child. Let them know when you're going to be putting the spoon or fork in their mouth. Tell them what is on it. Think, think about how you would want to be fed if you were in that situation. Um, so you want to explain to the classroom staff uh, why the food texture is being modified. They may not completely understand that. Um, that for, for example, that the child chews so long that they're fatiguing. So we're gonna use a softer texture so that they can get more nutrition in. Uh, we also wanna explain to them why the modifications are so important. In some cases, it's so that the child will not choke or so that they don't aspirate. The classroom staff needs to know how important those modifications are because they are implementing them and stressing that the safe plan needs to be written as followed. Um, you also want to talk to the staff about universal precautions uh, to uh, prevent infection. Of course, this is really something we always should have been done and we really need to do more now than ever. So training considerations is 
um, just to let them know a little bit of the basic oral mechanism issues that this child may be having, what positioning is recommended, uh, where the feeder should sit in relation to the student, um, how they can provide support during the meal, the utensil selection and the use of them, the spoon presentation and placement, special dietary needs of the student, common problems and troubleshooting during meal times, communication and socialization, socialization and goals during mealtime and how to end the meal. Um, so all of these things, it sounds like a lot and it is a lot for these paraprofessionals to learn and understand, but all of it is very important in them knowing uh, not just rotely doing the plan, but really buying into it and making it something that they become experts in. So once the basic feeding instruction is completed, um, at the client uh, specific training schedule is provided. So you might start with one, the first meal, you will review and explain the plan. Uh, the classroom feeder would then observe the uh, SLP or the OT training uh, feeding the child uh, and give uh, an opportunity for the new feeder to offer a small portion of the meal under the direct supervision. So it's going to be a very controlled first meal. Then by the second meal, you want the new feeder to perform all aspects of the meal um, under the direct supervision of the trainer, which would most often be the SLP or the OT, and then talk to them and have input, let them ask questions about why they're doing it and what's going on. By the third meal, you're hoping that the new feeder is independent and that the trainer is positioned nearby to assist should they need it. So following some kind of schedule like this, that is a graduated one where they eventually, but before they even start on this, they need to be familiar with the child's safe eating plan. Uh, that's one of the first things. Then they need to know that you're gonna demonstrate for them what needs to be done and how it should be done. Um, then you're going to observe them and let them, you know, guide them through the process. And then they can practice. They can practice with a student. They can also practice with each other. So now we're going to talk a little bit about food and texture modification and liquid modification. And we did have a couple of comments, oh, uh, questions yeah. uh, in the chat. Um, Hannah wanted to know, is there a certificate for paraprofessionals on this topic? Not that I know of. Um, you know, I think every uh, school has their own way of documenting uh, verification of training. I know that uh, in some cases, uh, when classroom staff is trained to distribute seizure medications, they are trained and they have to sign something. So that's why on our safe eating plan, we do put the verification at the bottom, indicating that the uh, paraprofessional was uh, adequately trained and understands the plan. We had a situation where they weren't following the plan and then they said, well, you didn't train us, right, or whatever. So that's why we put the verification on the bottom of the form. But I don't know of anything in particular that is available for that. Um, I also, Sarah, did you want to comment at all on uh, the communication needs during um modeling that um i just think you know we have so many complex communicators and during a meal time especially with our students who are you know really at risk for adverse events we have to make sure that we set up a um, robust communication system for them and it may look different than what the building slp is working on um and i have specific examples of that but we also you know a simple placemat with mealtime icons um, and also using all of and validating all of their modalities um, during mealtime. The other thing that we train is that we don't implement communication goals or work on those during mealtimes because it's duty free. So I just think I wanted to share that, you know, it's all part of, of our responsibility. Wonderful suggestions. I know in my district now they're doing social stories on eating so that the children can kind of learn what to expect and how to do it. And, and they have icons that they, so all of that is really, really good. Um, and I agree with you totally. We don't want to work on communication. We don't want to work on uh, therapy with feeding at meals. You know, we want mealtime to be just mealtime. So that was an important comment. 
And one more, uh, Brooke, wanted to, uh, Brooke has a question about CPR and Heimlich training. Brooke, did you wanna ask that personally? Sure, yeah, I'm just wondering, I know each state has different guidelines or some, I guess, don't have guidelines, but um, what, what would you suggest as far as who should be trained in the room? I mean, every feeder that feeds the child or have one adult at least in the room, or is there a certain like child to adult ratio that you feel like should be trained in CPR and Heimlich? What do you suggest? So, you know, of course, this is my personal opinion. I really feel the entire classroom staff should be uh, trained in Heimlich and CPR. Um, I think they are the ones that are going to be most likely to um, experience a child having difficulty like that. Um, it, I feel like it should be part of an annual training for paraprofessionals and teachers in classes such as severe profound, mild moderate autism, mm -hmm. children that are very high risk. So all said I, paraprofessionals I, and teachers. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Okay. That's my opinion. Right. Um, and sometimes some districts have uh, managed to get nurses who are trained to train on the Heimlich and that, because you know not all nurses can do that, um, which was really nice. So that if you have someone employed in your district that can do the training, they can do it after school and, and that kind of thing. So yeah. it's not that easy to get everyone trained, but it's very, very important. We are seeing more and more children choking uh, to death at school. And uh, so I don't think it's ever been more important to have the Heimlich uh, in those classes that those those staff members know what to do. Yeah. It's very important. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now let's talk about food texture and liquid modification. You're going to need to determine who's going to be preparing the food modification. Um, ideally, I, I want the cafeteria program to do it. They are actually responsible for the modifications, but initially they may need some assistance from the team as to how to really organize providing the dysphagia, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative that is necessary. So um, once the are trained, I think you two will still want to monitor and check to make sure that it's really meeting the standards. And of course, that means that your team members need to be familiar with IDSI. And it's, it's a little complicated. It's something to go through. So seek out training for yourself in doing the IDSI. And I say IDSI because the National Dysphagia Dys Diet is on its way out. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to do ITSI. If you're just getting started, good time to just start with ITSI and not have to mess with the other or the changing. Um, so ITSI does, uh, in some ways, uh, para, uh, mirror the other, the national diet, but it has a few more areas. This is the um, schema that they use, and you can see one blends into the next, the the softest foods become liquids and, and on down. And on their website, there's specific uh, instruction on how to test for each of these. So you can see in this picture, soft and bite size was previously mechanical soft, okay, which we're familiar with, right? And that's what that looks like. Minced and moist um, was also mechanically soft. So you can see how Itsy kind of broke it down a little bit more because this is a big difference. The one on the left is a big difference from the one in the middle, the consistency. And you can see where some of your children would struggle with the mechanical soft, uh, the first one, but would do very well with the second one. And then of course there's a puree that has no lumps, not sticky, falls off the spoon. Okay, so now let's talk about training new personnel, annual procedural training, and that we're basically talking about core team members, uh, the classroom teachers and the paraprofessional. So in order to make a procedure work, the staff must be trained. We've been saying that crazy, crazy. Okay, so annual detail training and overview training for teachers. All new hires should be trained. We made it part of our, um, you know how you train new personnel? There was a whole section to, uh, dedicated to swallowing. Okay, training classroom staff in undernutrition. And I've talked about this before. It's really, when you look at the types of students we see in our schools uh, that would have swallowing and feeding disorders, 
almost all of them are high risk for undernutrition and dehydration. So it's really important that our classroom staff learns how to recognize when a child is struggling with this, okay? Um, so you want the school nurse to teach them the symptoms of undernutrition and dehydration and what to look for and what steps to take if they suspect it. So I made this little chart here you can use. It just underlines the signs of undernutrition and the signs of dehydration, which you're probably more or less pretty familiar with. Uh, but this is something that could be printed out and given to a teacher. And then they can look and say, oh, I really think this child's undernourished. And so then what do they do? They go to the school nurse and say, I have a student I'm concerned about. I think they're undernourished. Uh, the nurse will then take responsibility for determining if there's an issue. This is what nurses do. This is a health issue. They will be able to let you know if it's a justified referral for undernutrition or dehydration. If the nurse determines that the student's undernourished or dehydrated, then the role that you can play, the swallowing and feeding team can play, is um, uh, determine a safe way for that child to eat. So it could be that the child is not getting enough nutrition because they're working so hard at chewing. So you can modify the texture of that food. It could be their positioning is bad and it's not going the right way and they're you know struggling with pain and things like that. So we can help, the team can help that way and the nurse certainly can help. Um, okay, so that really, uh, okay, now updating knowledge and skills, so important too. Um, if you're an SLP, there's now a dysphagia competency and verification tool and um, an article about it that you can access. Now, I just want to give you a heads up on this, that it is very medical adult uh, focused, okay? And like with everything, uh, we have to look at it from a school age children's thing. So there's gonna be things that they're gonna say you should know or you should be able to do that in the school setting, you really don't need to know and you don't need to do, okay? So you're gonna to have to be discriminate in how you read it. And I wouldn't suggest going through the official, go through and see what, they, what score you get, um, but you could. Um, and then for our OTs, uh, I know there is a article um, in your journal from 2007 that really outlines the knowledge and skills uh, for feeding and eating. And that would be something you could reference and then take that information and determine where do you guys need to supplement your skills? Do you need more anatomy and physiology? Or do you need some uh, training on recognizing aspiration and how to treat it? Or maybe working with children with cerebral palsy. So just make a plan based on these uh, tools that for what you need to fit fill in your competency. Uh, brainstorm together, and this was my brainstorming here. You have your, you can do your own brainstorming. What are some virtual courses you can do together? Uh, ASHA has a learning pass for SLPs that is extremely reasonable. Uh, it's, I think it's 144 a year. Your district might even offer to buy that for you guys. And you have access to all their courses. Uh, in addition, As ASHA has committed to a schools bundle that will be coming in the future. And then there's other providers that are also very good. Um, you can do group virtual classes, talk about journal articles or books, have a journal discussion group or a learning group. Um, there's a lot of ways to really update those skills. Um, these are some of the websites that have uh, training for both SLPs and OTs on how to address swallowing and feeding, not specifically in the schools, but it gives you good information. These websites are also very important. Uh, feeding Matters Dysphagia Cafe has a whole section under pediatric that does have a few articles on school-based services. And then two wonderful videos from HMS School for Cerebral Palsy. Um, this is free for everyone to view uh, and they're very good, password is HMS. Uh, so other ways you can audit or take a graduate level course in dysphagia at your local university. Uh, you can talk to your, your, your district about offering a course from the local campus uh, during the summer or after school for SLPs and OTs who want this information, who want to have a graduate level course, who maybe don't, or it's been a long time. 
Uh, other strategies that will help is to have a mentor program. Determine the professionals in your district who have the knowledge and skills and experience and work with your administration to give them some time to help mentor the rest of you. So uh, maybe two half days a week would be more than enough. Um, learn about each student. Think about the students you have on your caseload with swelling and feeding and what are their signs and what can you do for each of it? So kind of specialize with that student. So if you have a child with Down syndrome, we know that they encounter problems with feeding and swallowing due to their physical, medical and behavioral issues, low mus muscle tone, sensory issues, food refusal, low endurance uh, or issues with oral motor. So they have a lot of issues. You may need to address poor lip closure, low tone, uncoordinated swallow and um, underlying respiratory issues and chewing difficulties. This is something you can research and learn about with the students you're working with, particularly if you have a mentor there to help guide you. Now, quick shift into leadership and then we'll take last comments and questions. Um, this, uh, this says this really is an innovative approach, but I'm afraid we can't consider it. it's never been done before. Um, you, you may um, encounter this when you go to your administration, they may say, well, we, we, nobody does this, we don't do this. Um, but true leadership is really moving beyond that. And I think most of you, all of you here today are leaders in your programs and that's why you're here trying to learn about it. Um, a leader is someone who can see how things can be improved and who is able to rally people to move toward a better vision, okay? Um, oops. Uh, they help themselves and others to do the right things, which really applies to what we're talking about, okay? Um, the traits of effective leaders are that they inspire action. And so we've been talking about training today and certainly inspiring each of those team members to take action to do the right thing for children is really important if you can do that. They're usually very optimistic people. So being optimistic and feeling like this is something we can do, we can do it well, let's do it together and support and facilitate the team. Communication, of course, is always an important part of an effective leader. And they're frequently very decisive and kind of know where they're going and what they're doing. And I think if you look at this, you probably see yourself in some of this. What leadership is not, it's not about doing everything yourself. It's not a position. Uh, you know, so if you have a position, all of a sudden you're a leader. No, uh, you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Uh, leadership is not about being outgoing or outspoken. The quietest person can be a very effective leader. And it's not about making friends or being popular. Okay, and then some more, go uh, some more uh, quotes that I like, and you're, they're in your handouts, you can read them. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about, ooh, running out of time, uh, some of the things we did in our school district when we were starting, we did six hours of training for all uh, core team members for at least eight years. And then we dropped it down to 30. We brought in national speakers, local professionals from hospitals, uh, school district SLPs who had experience and knowledge, viewed webinars to go as a group. We uh, were able to organize a course from Southeastern U Louisiana University Speech and Language Department in dysphagia. Um, we pulled all the classroom teachers of severe profound, mild moderate, autism and preschool together to train them. And we did the same thing for paraprofessionals. After that, we did it more on a local level. Uh, we did train, uh, did a, I did a training for our uh, special ed department uh, administrators, people like coordinators, IEP facilitators and that so that they would know, presented at uh, school board meetings and presented to school principals so that everyone within the district knew. Now I wanna tell you about Mary, this is a short one. <laughs> uh, Mary has cerebral palsy and was eating a chopped and bite-sized diet all year. The safe eating plan was effective and everything was going well until Mary got the flu. When she returned to school, the teacher noticed that she was coughing during breakfast and lunch and she was starting to refuse to eat. The classroom paraphernalia was previously trained on changes that can occur 
and would warrant a revision in the plan. So the paraprofessional shared with the speech therapist who was doing her monitoring of the plan, like you know we talked about setting up, and um, the therapist went ahead and did a, a new swallow and food trial uh, examination to determine if a change in recommendations was needed. And they were. A new safe eating plan was written to reflect the changes and the classroom staff was trained on the new plan. She was then placed on moist and minced diet and was able to eat without incident. However, the swallow team did notify Mary's family and physician of the changes so that they could maybe take a look medically at what was happening to Mary. Okay, that's it. We made it. And comments, questions? How are you feeling? I just